Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, techniques for either pressure-directed embolotherapy or otherwise flow diversion therapy. Uh, but like anything, um, there's no point in, in doing something uh, if there's no evidence or there's no theory behind it. So there's got to be a theory as to why we, we do this and, and where the benefit is. And so uh, when I started to read around pressure-directed embolotherapy, I, I read or delved a little bit more into some of the science. And the more you delve into it, the more interesting it becomes. And it's like anything, uh, especially in oncology, we grossly underestimate uh, tumor biology and tumor physiology. Uh, and again, like I showed you yesterday in my talk, uh, tumors are very heterogeneous. And when it comes to embolizing tumors, uh, the reason that they're so heterogeneous uh, will become clear, hopefully, uh, in this talk. So uh, we're a very heavy oncology practice. Uh, we do a lot of uh, drug looting tastes uh, for non-resectable HCC. And then uh, in British Columbia in Canada, we are funded for Y90 for metastatic neuroendocrine for downstaging HCC to resectional transplant, and then uh, HCC with PVT. Uh, anything outside of that, it's a self-pay for the patient. So you can imagine in Canada with the exchange rate, it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty significant uh, burden for patients. Uh, but they can get it if they want. So we do very few colorectal cases. The majority of our cases now are actually uh, advanced HCC cases. Um, just quickly to, to go through some of the, uh, the, the history of embolization, uh, we're, we're on kind of second and third generation embolization when it comes to TACE, so either conventional or lapidal TACE or drug looting platforms, which I'll talk about more. Uh, our practice in Vancouver changed a lot uh, in 2014 uh, because we got funding from the provincial government to do drug looting TACE, mainly to get the patients out uh, on the same day as the procedure. So. 85% uh, of our cases are done uh, as day case for taste, and we do a lot of low bar taste because we see a huge hepatitis B population. We have a lot of uh, Korean, Japanese, Chinese uh, uh, immigrants, and they get a lot of uh, uh, HCC because uh, Hep B is uh, is endemic. Uh, when we, uh, we we first started using drug looting technology, I think all of us were hoping that uh, it would standardize the way that we treated patients, that the handling would be a lot more simpler, and also the complications would go down. There's no question that the complications or the side effects of taste are very different if you use conventional versus drug-eluting taste. Unfortunately, we still haven't standardized the way we do taste. It's very heterogeneous depending on where you go uh, as, to, uh, as to how people do it. As with anything, when, it, when you embolize something, there's a give and a take. So, uh, you get increased local deposition and you decrease your systemic toxicity depending on the platform that you use. Uh, and it can increase uh, response when it comes to adjunct techniques for local regional therapy. The problem is that when you embolize anything, you uh, cause ischemia and you may not necessarily cause cell death. And so you upregulate VEGF tyrosine kinase. And that's because of cellular hypoxia. And uh, we have some uh, postgrads doing work in Vancouver on... Um, on looking for biomarkers for cellular hypoxia on MRI to try and see if that isn't a, uh, somehow a predictor very early on after your embolization as to um, whether or not you've completely embolized tumors or if you've just exposed cells to hypoxia and not killed them uh, and they are at much more risk for um, upregulation. Uh, so quickly, if we kind of look a little bit more into the science of how we get medication or anything into the tumors, the reason that this slide is important is because, you know, in the next uh, few years, we're going to move away probably from outdated drugs like uh, doxorubicin uh, for treating these tumors, and we're going to move to viral vectors, stem cell therapy, much more advanced techniques. And to, to be able to do that, you need to understand how we get these into cells. And so you can either get it through diffusion, lateral membrane diffusion, intercellular junction transport, intracellular fenestration transport, and vesicular transport. And when it comes to viral vectors and stem cells, uh, intercellular and intracellular fenestration transport is kind of the number that you're looking at. So you're working on a very, very small level. And because you're working at such a microscopic level when it comes to getting these uh, into cells, uh, there's been a lot of research into, um, you know, uh, what, well, how um, tumors behave and how tumors behave differently compared to normal tissue. So 
we know that uh, tumors don't have the same blood supply as normal tissue, and the reason they don't is because they have all these abnormal growth factors which stimulate angiogenesis, and so you get a very irregular blood supply to that tumor, and actually within the tumor itself, you get this very disorganized uh, blood supply. And so instead of going from large to small, uh, it can be a very disorganized um, flow through the tissue. So, you know, if you just look at this slide, you can see there the more disorganized your tumor is, uh, the more heterogeneous your blood supply is. And this is again why uh, all embolics behave very differently. So the embolic that you use uh, will not be the same for every single tumor, and it won't be the same for every single product. So you need to be very critical about the embolic platform that you use for taste. Uh, and so the size and the substrate that you use for embolization makes a huge difference. So this is a study that we did um, a few years ago uh, looking at um, uh, superabsorbent polymer microspheres and the embolic effect or what the effect was on uh, uh, tissue. And so what we did was we embolized these tumors. We then did an explant and we looked at it under a microscope. And two things came out of the study. The first one is that there's little or no effect from doxorubicin. So there's almost no cell death immediately adjacent to the doxorubicin, even though there are some papers in the literature that claim that there is diffusion of doxorubicin. Um, especially with drug eluting platforms, the dox stays bound to the, uh, to the microsphere, whichever one you're using. And so when you look at this, there's almost no upstream necrosis. All of it is downstream. And so this is an embolic effect. And these are just some of those histology slides showing uh, these are hepaspheres uh, within uh, cells. And there's no uh, upstream uh, necrosis, all downstream necrosis. Uh, and so we then looked at all different types of embolics, different size of embolics, and different uh, um, constitutions of uh, embolics to see if it made any difference in terms of the outcome. And so what we did was we uh, took patients who were unresectable. Uh, we treated them either with very small beads, so 70, uh, 70 to 150, 100 to 300. Um, and those are a DC bead or LC bead uh, in the US. And then uh, 50 to 100 of uh, um, superabsorbent polymer microspheres, which are hepaspheres, which uh, are not licensed to be loaded uh, in the US. Primary endpoint was M resist, and then secondary endpoint time to progression. And so again, at this question of what is the ideal particle size for uh, chemoembolization, uh, this is the results of the study. Um, uh, sorry, let me just slide this forward. So if you look at this, um, there's no question that if you have a more compliant particle, you often get more distal into the tissue, and you get better uh, embolization. Uh, and so even with a very small particle, you can see we didn't use any DC, the, the small DC beads. I'll show you another um, slide in a second. But if you use a 100 to 300, these 50 to 100 are very similar sizes. You get a very, very different um, outcome in terms of your embolic effect. Now, the question that came up from this study was, is there a way to get rid of the 6.7% of patients who progress with embolization? Is there a way to decrease that number? In other words, improve the embolization in some way to try and get this 6.7% down to something more acceptable? Um, and so the question is, can we change the substrate? So in other words, can we change the embolic particle? Um, can we change the dose or the drug? Well, at the moment, uh, changing the drug isn't really a huge option. Can we change end organ biology or, or um, uh, tumor biology? No, um, or not at the moment at least. Um, and then is there a way to drive more embolic into the tumor? And realistically, uh, these things are probably gonna come with time. Uh, definitely changing tumor biology uh, with some systemic medications potentially uh, will improve outcomes uh, at some point. Uh, and so what we can do at the moment with what we have is try and drive more embolic uh, into the tumor. Uh, and so if you look at the uh, mechanism of action of, of pressure-directed embolotherapy or pressure-directed taste, uh, there's two mechanisms. The first one is to, to decrease the pressure distal to your balloon. Uh, and in, in doing that, what you do is you increase the flow into the tumor because it's a hypervascular bed. And because you've decreased the flow distal to the balloon, you get the sump effect uh, from your tumor, and you also close down these collaterals which feed the tumor and act as competitive uh, blood flows. The other thing which I'm going to talk about in a second is uh, interstitial hypertension. Um, and so, like I said, there's two ways to overcome tumor physiology. The one is to inflate a balloon kind of proximal, uh, and redirect flow 
into the tumor. And so what you'll do in a situation like this is because your tumor is hypervascular, um, it'll sump a lot more blood than no your normal parenchyma. So the theory behind this is uh, that you can redirect your particles without actually physically blocking off uh, these side branches. The other um, method is by actually inserting your catheter as distal as possible, blocking off that blood vessel, and then pressurizing the tumor. In other words, pushing as much particle into the tumor as possible and beyond that embolic endpoint where you get the reflux. So when you're doing pressure-directed taste, for example, there's, your embolic endpoint is not the same because you'll go to... Uh, stasis, but you need to go beyond stasis and try and uh, essentially pack the particles uh, into the tumor. So here's an example of a patient post microwave ablation who recurred, wasn't a surgical candidate, uh, and you can see uh, a very, very faint arterial blush. And when you see uh, chemoembolization, or when you see uh, angiographic images like this prior to chemoembolization, these patients often don't do well because you know, it's not a highly vascular tumor, and you almost never get your full dose of embolic uh, into the tumor. And so trying to use something where you can, you know, really force your particles into the tumor will probably help. And so this, we used a surefire system, but we got all the dose in, which there's no way we would have got in uh, without using some form of an embolization technique uh, with... Uh, uh, with a balloon or anti-reflux device. And if you, you look at the uh, CT scan at one month, you can see there's almost a just geographical devascularization of the parenchyma and then uh, complete infarction within the tumor. So this was a, a M-resist CR. Uh, so completely uh, killed the tumor. And then again, you know, this is just because you're packing those particles into your hepatic parenchyma and going beyond that... Uh, that embolic endpoint. And the reason that you're doing that is to try and decrease your upregulation of VEGF and all of your anti-angiogenic uh, or uh, pro-angiogenetic uh, uh, factors, which stimulate this very abnormal tumoral growth. And that's what you're trying to avoid. You're trying to avoid causing tissue hypoxia without cell death. And the problem is, uh, often when, you, when you're dealing with tumors, uh, it's difficult to balance the pro- and anti-angiogenic uh, factors. And so, you know, to get to something like this where you, you basically outweigh your um, anti-angiogenetic and or outweigh your pro, sorry, and stimulate your anti-angiogenetic factors, it's, it's not exactly easy to do. And the reason that it's not uh, easy to do is because tumors have a very abnormal lymphatic drainage. And so what happens is you get this increase in interstitial hypertension uh, around the tumor. And so what that means is that you have to overcome this area of interstitial hypertension around the tumor to be able to get the particles into it. So although the center of the tumor is a sump, once you saturate the center of the tumor, getting particles into the periphery of the tumor becomes much more difficult. And the reason it becomes difficult is because uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, decreased lymphatic drainage causes this increase in, in uh, pressure in the periphery of the tumor and, and so you go to an embolic endpoint, which may not necessarily be the real endpoint of your embolization. And so the theory behind pressure-directed taste is to overcome this uh, interstitial hypertension and drive more particles into the periphery of the tumor uh, to get a much better uh, embolic effect. And again, it's all about overcoming this kind of uh, peripheral high pressure around the tumor. So getting particles into the center of the tumor is not necessarily the problem. And that's why we always see recurrence at the edge of the tumor. We never see recurrence in the center and a dead uh, peripheral tumor. It's always in the, on the periphery of the tumor. Uh, and so if we can overcome this interstitial hypertension, uh, you're less likely to cause tumor hypoxia. And the problem with tumor hypoxia without cell death is that you upregulate all of your growth factors. And that's what you're trying to avoid. You're trying to avoid all of this upregulation of tyrosine kinase uh, and VEGF. Uh, again, like I, sh I showed you the slide yesterday, uh, tumor blood supply is very, very heterogeneous. And again, you know, avoiding or, or trying to overcome this heterogeneous blood supply by not relying solely on the vascular supply and blood flow to it, but in other words, forcing embolics into the tumor is probably something that we need to explore more. And again, I showed you the slide yesterday, how disorganized the blood supplies to these tumors because of this, uh, the, uh, the, the abnormal uh, blood vessel supply through the tumor. Uh, this is a study that we published in uh, JVIR looking at tumor heterogeneity and perfusion blood volume analysis. And again, we discussed this yesterday, how heterogeneous the blood supply is uh, to all of these tumors. 
So at the moment, uh, there are a number of anti-reflux catheters on the market. There's the uh, Surefire device, which has been available for a long time. Uh, the newer device called the Precision is a lot more trackable than the older devices, um, but this is expensive. It's pretty cost prohibitive when you try and use this on uh, a lot of your taste patients. This is Terumo's uh, Oclusafe, uh, which is a very trackable catheter. It's a lot cheaper uh, than Surefire. It doesn't cause spasm anywhere near as much uh, as the Surefire did, although you don't get the spasm that we used to get with Surefire. Uh, it's an 017 ID, so you have to be aware of that uh, depending on the embolic that you're using, and therefore you need an 014 wire. Um, and then we have the Sniper catheter, which is, is made by Embolics, which is a very low-profile, trackable catheter. There's two different tip shapes, and we heard a little bit uh, earlier about its use in, or potential use, uh, in prostate embolization. It has a very high um, uh, infusion pressure, so you can inject at 900 PSI, O2O ID, so larger than the, uh, the Terumo uh, Oclusafe. And again, so you can inj inject larger particles. Uh, it's rigid more proximally and much more flexible distally, so you get a lot more trackability and pushability uh, with the catheter. Uh, and if you look at some of the studies looking at uh, balloon-assisted taste using lipidol, you get a much higher incidence of lipidol deposition in your tumor. And there have been multiple studies looking at lipidol deposition and its correlation with cell death. And there's no question that if you can stain more lipidol in your tumor, you're much more likely to get a durable response to uh, your embolotherapy. Uh, and so uh, when you look at lipidol filling, it increases your survival because you're getting a much better uh, embolic result. In addition to balloon-assisted taste, uh, if you use some form of balloon-assisted uh, um, uh, delivery, especially for uh, Y90, you get a very different distribution in your tumor. And again, this is because of tumor heterogeneity and hypervascularity. So if you look here, this is, a, again, using a Surefire device. This is an end hole catheter. And then using the Surefire catheter, you get a very different distribution of MAA uh, within the tumor with uh, a much more or much higher concentration of your radio tracer in the tumor and a much less uh, a much lower distribution of radio tracer in the parenchyma. And again, this is all about changing flow dynamics uh, into the, um, the embolization bed or the delivery bed so that your hypervascular tumors are the ones that take up the majority of either your embolic or uh, your technetium, which obviously will uh, mimic your Y90 deposition. And this, again, there's multiple studies showing a much better distribution of uh, uh, radioembolic in tumors compared to the surrounding parenchyma using some form of balloonous um, occlusion device. Uh, and again, so uh, I spoke earlier about the 6.7%, so we looked at about 25 patients who had failed uh, chemoembolization, so these are progressive disease patients. We then treated them using a pressure-directed TACE, and we got an 87.5% complete uh, response and a 12.5% partial response. So we significantly increased those patients' response rates. And so the question remains, you know, how many of these patients in the, you know, partial response stable disease group, if we treat it with a pressure-directed taste initially, would be a complete response patient? And I think that's where we need to do a lot more research in terms of where balloon-assisted taste fits into the paradigm of chemoembolization. You know, is it for everyone? Difficult to know yet. I don't think we have enough evidence yet, but there's no question that it will provide some benefit for some patients. And so uh, when you do a pressure-directed taste, this is, this is often the image that you get. You get the staining within the, the perihepatic uh, venules uh, and in the perilymphatic venules as well. Uh, and so this has obviously gone well beyond your normal embolization endpoint. So you're actually pressurizing your hepatic parenchyma. And that's why you get that geographical distribution on your post-embolization CT. So that patient who I just showed you, this is the uh, one-month follow-up CT with no residual enhancement, multiple tumors treated with a complete response. And these patients are very difficult to treat often, these hepatitis C patients with multifocal tumors uh, where you're trying to embolize tumors and trying to preserve parenchyma. Even with super selective taste, often you won't get enough embolic into those tumors to be able to get a durable result. This is a paper from the Mount Sinai group looking at uh, uh, balloon-occluded uh, taste uh, with a really good overall response rate, good disease control rate, uh, and again, using a combination of drug-looting taste and uh, a conventional taste. Uh, and their uh, results uh, mimic ours uh, pretty well. We got a, a really good uh, response rate using a highly compliant uh, drug-looting particle. 
Um, in terms of you know, which patients are better than others, I think it's difficult yet to know because we don't have enough evidence, but what we do is we do a CT scan, we look at the blood supply to the tumors, and we look at previous treatments. And if the, if these patients have had previous treatments and they failed or they haven't had a good response, these are the ones that we'll usually look at doing pressure-directed taste uh, rather than end whole catheter taste. And then just looking at some uh, um, cases using uh, the sniper and uh, uh, Y90. So you can see here there's a lot of non-target uh, parenchyma that you want to try and avoid treating. And again, you know, using a proximal uh, uh, balloon occlusion uh, technique where you um, get more of your radioembolic into the tumor and avoid the non-target bed. So again, this is not getting beyond your non-target bed. This is just changing your flow dynamics uh, within your, your target tissue bed and redirecting uh, your uh, radioembolic into the tumor rather than into the normal parenchyma. So you concentrate your radioembolic in the tumor rather than in your non-target tissue. So these are two different concepts. One is pressurizing your system and the other one is diverting or trying to redirect flow into your, your more hypervascular segment of your bed. Uh, and this is another case just looking at uh, uptake, um, you know, three months uh, after a, a standard microcatheter compared to one year following a uh, balloon, occluded, uh, balloon occlusion uh, technique where you have no uptake. Uh, within the liver and then, you know, still multiple residually enhancing tumors. And these are the kinds of situations that we're trying to avoid, these patients who fail local regional therapy. Because, you know, once you've failed local regional therapy, your treatment options decrease significantly. Uh, and here again, it's just looking at uh, tumoral uptake, um, you know, with minimal parenchymal blushing compared to increased tumoral fill. Uh, using uh, the sniper device. So again, you just decrease your non-target uh, tissue delivery and you increase your tumor delivery. Uh, and again, this is a slightly different concept to pressure-directed taste, but it's again, it's two different concepts using balloon occlusion techniques. One is a more proximal technique and the other one is a more distal pressurized uh, technique. But there's no question there is some value uh, in using some form of a balloon occlusion technique to try and optimize your drug delivery. And whether that is taste, Y90, whatever you're doing, uh, pot potentially in, in prostate embolization as well, maybe optimizing uh, your delivery of your drug to your target tissue and minimizing your uh, non-target delivery. Uh, another case uh, with the uh, sniper device, here's your uh, lesion on pre-procedural MRI. This is with the balloon deflated, and this is with the sniper balloon inflated. So again, all of these non-target vessels don't enhance as avidly as they as they would with an end hole catheter. This is the balloon inflated and it just redirects the flow to the much more hypervascular tissue bed. And if you can do this in your cases and just optimize your tumoral drug delivery and minimize your parenchymal drug delivery in a non-selective fashion, it's gonna be better for your patient, better outcomes and less, uh, less delivery to, uh, to non-target tissue. And this goes for pretty much any organ uh, that you're treating. So just some take-home points. I think uh, balloon-assisted delivery of anything that you're doing uh, has benefit. It's not just for embolic protection. It can be for flow redistribution uh, or for uh, pressurizing your embolic bed. There is no question that there is some benefit to pressure-directed embolotherapy. The question is, can we find the ideal patients to treat with pressure-directed embolotherapy? And I think for sure in a certain subset of patients, it may be uh, the first line of therapy, especially patients who have been heavily pre-treated with medications where they have small vessels, they've had previous radiotherapy, previous chemotherapy, where you're just not going to get the same amount of drug into the tissue. And then obviously to spare non-target tissue. Uh, and then definitely with very compliant small particles where you worried about shunting, uh, you, again, you can use these balloon occlusion techniques uh, to minimize your uh, non-target uh, embolization. Thanks very much. Thank you.